Today, we will discuss Chapter 9 of Psychology textbook of Class 11th, that is, Motivation and Emotion. This chapter has been divided into three parts. Today, we will discuss the first part, which covers nature of motivation, different types of motives, which include biological motives and psychosocial motives. We will start with the concept of nature of motivation. The concept of motivation focuses on explaining what moves behavior. In fact, the term motivation is derived from the Latin word mover, referring to the movement of activity. Most of our everyday explanation of behavior is given in terms of motives. Why do you come to the school or college? There may be any number of reasons for this behavior, such as you want to learn or to make friends, you need a diploma or a degree to get a good job, you want to make your parents happy and so on. Some combination of these reasons or others would explain why you choose to go in for higher education. Motives also help us in making predictions about behavior. A person will work hard in school, in sports, in business, in music and in many other situations if he or she has a very strong need for achievement. Hence, motives are the general states that enable us to make predictions about behavior in many different situations. In other words, motivation is one of the determinants of behavior. Instincts, drives, needs, goals and incentives come under the broad cluster of motivation. And let's move to the next concept of the motivational cycle. The concept of need is now used to describe the motivational properties of behavior. But what is a need? A need is a lack or deficit of some necessity. The condition of need leads to drive. A drive is a state of tension or arousal produced by a need. It energizes random activity. When one of the random activities leads to a goal, it reduces the drive and the organism stops being active. The organism returns to a balanced state. The process of motivation functions in a cycle, that is, need will lead to drive, drive will lead to arousal, Arousal will lead to goal-directed behavior, then it will lead to achievement and then reduction of arousal and in the end need again. There are different types of motives. Basically, there are two types of motives, biological and the psychosocial motives. Biological motives are also known as physiological motives as they are guided mostly by the physiological mechanisms of the body. On the other hand, psychosocial motives are primarily learned from the individual's interactions with the various environmental factors. However, both type of motives are interdependent upon each other. That is, in some kind of situations, the biological factors may trigger a motive, whereas in some other situations, the psychosocial factors may trigger the motive. Now let's first start with the biological motives. The biological or the physiological approach to explain motivation is the earliest attempt to understand the causes of behavior. Most of the theories which developed later still carry traces of the influence of the biological approach. The approach adhering to the concept of adaptive act holds that organism have needs that produces drive, which stimulates behavior, leading to certain action towards achieving certain goals which reduce the drive. Instinct. The term instinct denotes inborn patterns of behavior that are biologically determined rather than learn. It refers to an urge to do something. Instinct has an impetus which drives the organism to do something to reduce that impetus. Some common human instincts include curiosity, flight, repulsion, reproduction, 
parental care etc instincts are innate tendencies found in all members of a species that direct behavior in a predictable way some of the basic biological needs explained by this approach are hunger thirst and sex which are essential for the sustenance of the individual the first biological motive is hunger when someone is hungry the need for food dominates everything else it motivates people to obtain and consume food but what makes us feel hungry studies have indicated that many events inside and outside the body may trigger hunger or inhibit it the stimuli for hunger include stomach contractions which signify that the stomach is empty a low concentration of glucose in the blood a low level of protein and the amount of fats stored in the body the liver also responds to the lack of bodily fuel by sending nerve impulses to the brain the aroma taste or appearance of food may also result in a desire to eat It may be noted that none of these alone gives you the feeling that you are hungry. All in combination act with external factors such as taste, color, by observing others eating and the smell of food to help you understand that you are hungry. Thus, it can be said that our food intake is regulated by a complex feeding satiety system located in the hypothalamus, liver, and other parts of the body as well as the external cues available in the environment the liver sends a signal to a part of the brain called hypothalamus the two regions of hypothalamus are involved in hunger the lateral hypothalamus and the ventromedial hypothalamus lh is considered to be the excitatory area animals eat when this area is stimulated when it is damaged animals stop eating and die of starvation the ventromedial hypothalamus is located in the middle of the hypothalamus which is otherwise known as the hunger controlling area which inhibits the hunger drive the second biological motive is thirst when we are deprived of water for a period of several hours the mouth and the throat become dry which leads to the dehydration of body tissues Drinking water is necessary to wet a dry mouth but a dry mouth does not always result in water drinking behavior in fact processes within the body itself control thirst and drinking of water water must get into the tissues sufficiently to remove the dryness of mouth and throat motivation to drink water is mainly triggered by the conditions of the body loss of water from cells and reduction of blood volume when water is lost by bodily fluids water leaves the interior of the cells the anterior hypothalamus contains nerve cells called osmoreceptors which generate nerve impulses in case of cell dehydration these nerve impulses act as a signal for thirst and drinking when thirst is regulated by loss of water from the osmoreceptors it is called cellular dehydration thirst the third biological motive is sex one of the most powerful drives in both animals and human beings is the sex drive motivation to engage in sexual activity is a very strong factor influencing human behavior however sex is far more than a biological motive it is different from other primary motives hunger and thirst in many ways like first sexual activity is not necessary for an individual's survival second homeostasis the tendency of the organism as a whole to maintain constancy or to attempt to restore equilibrium if constancy is disturbed is not the goal of sexual activity and sex drive develops with age in case of lower animals it depends on many physiological conditions but in case of human beings the sex drive is very closely regulated biologically sometimes it is very difficult to classify sex purely as a biological drive 
physiologists suggest that intensity of the sexual urge is dependent upon chemical substances circulating in the blood, known as sex hormones. Studies on animals as well as human beings have mentioned that sex hormones secreted by gonads, that is, testes in males and the ovaries in females are responsible for sexual motivation. Sexual motivation is also influenced by other endocrine glands such as pituitary glands. Sexual drive in human beings is primarily stimulated by external stimuli and its expression depends upon the cultural learning. So far we have covered the biological motives. Now let's come back to psychosocial motives. Psychosocial motives are mostly learned or acquired. Social groups such as family, neighborhood, friends and relatives do contribute a lot in acquiring social motives. These are complex forms of motives mainly resulting from the individual's interaction with her or his social environment. The first psychosocial motive is need for affiliation. Most of us need company or friend or want to maintain some form of relationship with others. Nobody likes to remain alone all the time. As soon as people see some kinds of similarities among themselves or they like each other, they form a group. Formation of group or collectivity is an important feature of human life. Often people try desperately to get close to other people, to seek their help and to become members of their group. Seeking other human beings and wanting to be close to them, both physically and psychologically, is called affiliation. It involves motivation for social contact. Need for affiliation is aroused when individuals feel threatened or helpless and also when they are happy. People high on this need are motivated to seek the company of others and to maintain friendly relationships with other people. The second psychosocial motive is need for power. Need for power is an ability of a person to produce intended effects on the behavior and the emotions of another person. The various goals of power motivation are to influence, control, persuade, lead and charm others and most importantly to enhance one's own reputation in the eyes of other people. There are four general ways of expression of the power motive. First, people do things to gain feeling of power and strength from sources outside themselves by reading stories about sports stars or attaching themselves to a popular figure. Second, power can also be felt from sources within us and may be expressed by building up the body and mastering urges and impulses. Third, people do things as individuals to have an impact on others. For example, a person argues, or competes with another individual in order to have an impact or influence on that person. Fourth, people do things as members of organizations to have an impact on others as in the case of the leader of a political party. The individual may use the party apparatus to influence others. However, for any individual, one of these ways of expressing power motivation may dominate, but with age and life experiences, it varies. The third psychosocial motive is need for achievement. You might have observed some students work very hard and compete with others for good marks or grades in the examination as good marks or grades will create opportunities for higher studies and better job prospects. It is the achievement motivation which refers to the desire of a person to meet standards of excellence. Need for achievement, also known as ENIC, energizes and directs behavior as well as influences the perception of situations. During the formative years of social development, children acquire achievement motivation. The sources from which they learn include parents, other role models and sociocultural influences. 
Persons high in achievement motivation tend to prefer tasks that are moderately difficult and challenging. They have stronger than average desire for feedback on their performance. That is to know how they are doing so that they can adjust their goals to meet the challenge. Last psychosocial motive is curiosity and exploration. Often people engage in activities without a clear goal or purpose, but they derive some kind of pleasure out of it. It is a motivational tendency to act without any specific identifiable goal. The tendency to seek for a novel experience, gain pleasure by obtaining information are signs of curiosity. Hence, curiosity describes behavior whose primary motive appears to remain in the activities themselves. What will happen if the sky falls on us? Questions of this kind, what will happen if, stimulate intellectuals to find answers. Studies show that this curiosity behavior is not only limited to human beings, animals too show the same kind of behavior. We are driven to explore the environment by our curiosity and our need for sensory stimulation. The need for varied types of sensory stimulations is closely related to curiosity. It is the basic motive and exploration and curiosity are the expressions of it. Our ignorance about a number of things around us becomes a powerful motivator to explore the world. We get easily bored with repetitive experiences, so we look for something new. In the case of infants and small children, this motive is very dominant. They get satisfaction from being allowed to explore, which is reflected in their smiling and babbling. In this way today, we have completed nature of motivation, different types of motives that is biological and the psychosocial motives. I hope you all have understood the concepts today.